before the afternoon. Before we get before started, we get started, we get started and we introduce, introduce our, our afternoon speakers, speakers. I would like, like to again take, take this take opportunity to thank our conference, conference sponsors, sponsors, supporters, and partners. We could not do this without your support. A special thank you also goes out to Nationwide Insurance and the Ohio Farm Bureau. I also want to again take this time, want to take this opportunity to thank my fellow planning committee members who helped make this conference such a success. Thank you, Dr. Magruder, Susan Jennings, Beth Bridgman, Ms. Cheryl Smith, Kenya Baker, Rachel Isaacson, and Stephen Cohn. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. After each keynote address, there should be time for a few questions. And if you have a question, please place it in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. For those of you who joined us this morning, our chat function was actually turned off. That function will actually be turned on this afternoon. And so we ask that you just be respectful during the comments of Ms. Ira Wallace, who is our afternoon keynote speaker. I am going to go ahead now and introduce my colleague, Ms. Beth Bridgman, who is going to be introducing our keynote speaker. Beth Bridgman is an associate professor of cooperative education and sustainable practice at Antioch College. She teaches a series of reskilling and resilience courses, exploring seed resilience, plant medicine, regenerative agriculture, and commensality. At Agraria, she teaches seed school and a variety of other reskilling workshops and serves as a scholar and editor on Grounded Hope and Agraria podcasts on regenerative agriculture. This summer, she will Beth will be offering a grain school in partnership with Antioch College, Agraria, and the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. I can't think of a, a better person to introduce our keynote speaker, Beth Bridgman. Thank you, Ariella. I really appreciate that. It's a great honor to introduce Ira Wallace today. I first met Ira at a Seed Savers Exchange Conference in 2014. And um, each year I enjoy getting the seed catalog from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. We have talked today about food sovereignty, but there can be no food sovereignty without seed sovereignty. And I honor the importance of the work of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and the work they're doing to increase variety as climate change continues to challenge what and how we are able to grow. Our knowledge of seed is embedded knowledge, or sorry, embodied, embodied knowledge. And in my own seed work, we focus on the great remembering, the seed stories, and the reaccessing of what we have always known. Not long ago, one of my students was interested in stories from seed stories from the African diaspora. And I suggested that she reach out to Ira, who graciously agreed to be interviewed. We now have these stories archived at Antioch. Ira Wallace is a worker owner of the cooperatively managed Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which offers over 700 varieties of open pollinated heirloom and organic seeds selected for flavor and regional adaptability. Southern Exposure helps people control their food supply by supporting sustainable home and market gardening, seed saving, and preserve their, preserving heirloom varieties. Iris serves on the boards of the Organic Seed Alliance and the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. In addition, Iris is a member of Acorn Community, which farms over 60 acres of certified organic land in central Virginia, growing seeds, alliums, hay, and conducting variety trials for Southern Exposure. She's a co-founder of the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello, a fun, family-friendly event featuring an old-time seed swap, 
local food, hands-on workshops and demos, and more. She presents at events throughout the Southeast. She currently writes about heirloom vegetable varieties for magazines and blogs, including Mother Earth News, Fine Gardening, and Southern Exposure. She also conducts variety trials for Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, as well as researching and documenting the history of varieties offered in the annual catalog. Her book, The Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast, and new state-specific book series, including Grow Great Vegetables in Virginia, are available online and at booksellers everywhere. Ira is currently working on creating an African diasporic seed collection. This is a legacy project for the 70-year-old seed saver, organic farmer, and heirloom seed pioneer, who is inspired by the work of Leah Penniman and the folks at Soulfire Farm. This will be a collection that honors and tells the stories of seeds that have been historically grown by and represent a part of the story of food and farming for black and brown people across the African diaspora. I'm so pleased to introduce Ira Wallace. Hi, Beth, thank you for that great introduction. Let's see if we can get my PowerPoint up here. <laughs> do you want me to do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we, ah, great. Uh, how am I gonna move it? Hi, I'm gonna talk a little bit about heirloom seeds and their stories and about Southern exposure and a little bit how uh, I got into all this. So let's see how we go. Heirloom seeds, we'll start out with defining that and some, uh, uh, so that we know we're talking about open pollinate seeds, ones that have been passed down through the generations. Family heirlooms are a special subset of that that we uh, get a lot of at Southern Exposure. And we really think it's important that these heirloom varieties be maintained. One of the things that gives urgency to the work that we do with making varieties available is the outside uh, climate. And this chart of concentration of uh, seed companies and the ownership of many of the open pollinated seed varieties by large uh, petrochemical uh, companies throughout the world. It has uh, really given urgency to our work in the last 20 years. Uh, another thing that is a background that uh, I didn't actually become aware of until a few years ago is the unwritten story of all of these black historical farmers who uh, developed varieties and were the backbone of agriculture, especially here in the southeast where I live. Uh, and it's only in indirect records that we're able to bring uh, that uh, knowledge out. And we'll do some of those stories. And then I wanted to uh, just take a minute and honor Tuskegee uh, Institute and its role historically in uh, bringing education and what a lot of what we call extension now uh, to the country. I uh, especially uh, honor the work of George Washington Carver. Um, and for myself, how did I get into this? I happen to be in this whole seed saving business. Well, I grew up with my grandmother, of course, who uh, was a gardener and did seed saving, mostly uh, of flowers. But, uh, I happened to move to uh, Cedar Grove, North Carolina, near Chapel Hill, at the time that uh, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens was doing a lot of work uh, with plant rescue and starting habitats and uh, seed saving of native plants uh, of North Carolina. And uh, I volunteered and learned a lot. And, oops. What is happening here? 
And uh, at that same time, I was beginning to live the uh, agrarian dream on our little farm uh, in North Carolina and then later uh, for a time in Canada. And there's me and my daughter uh, back in 1979 or so. <laughs> and after uh, working and living in uh, cooperative communities in a number of places, uh, including uh, North Carolina and Canada and traveling to kibbutz, uh, all of the time mostly living in cooperative uh, situations where working together is what allowed us uh, to own land and uh, to teach each other things. And this is the crowd at um, Southern Exposure a couple of years ago. Uh, at Southern Exposure, uh, we, the group of people who you saw at Acorn Community Farm are a part of what we have, but we also have a network of 50 to 70 uh, cooperating farms that grow seeds for us every year. And this is one of those farms, Brown Town Farms. And I thought they were a great uh, group to mention because uh, the Browns are all up and down Brown Town Road because they have heirs property plus property bought by members of the family and uh, have an amazing uh, work that they're doing there, both selling fresh produce to the community and uh, developing their seed saving skills. And one of uh, that day, you know, I was there with some Southern Exposure people and a friend from Jamaica who were there also trying to build up uh, a community organized uh, seed business. Here's Amira Mitchell, and uh, she is an important young woman in that she has been teaching seed savings to all kinds of people in the Philadelphia area and uh, also throughout the Southeast as a part of our Southeast Seed uh, Saving Network and has become a principal uh, teacher for the emerging Ujama uh, collective seed growers. And she uh, is a part of the team at True Love Seeds, a new online seed company that primarily uh, offers varieties from the African diaspora, uh, but also uh, many other immigrant uh, communities. And I just like seeing the so many brown and black faces in a, a seed company. Uh, we'll tell our first story. And this uh, fish pepper, which is known because it's the only variegated uh, heirloom uh, pepper that we know about, and it is an heirloom that's well known in the eastern shore of Maryland. And some people say, it's hard to pro uh, prove this, that all of the fish peppers that you find in heirloom catalogs now were descended from seeds uh, saved by a black man named Horace Pippin and then traded in exchange uh, with the grandfather of seed saver, William Moyes Weaver. Uh, but what we do know is that this pepper is uh, well known, uh, you know, as a fish sauce uh, and other hot sauce amendment in Maryland. Uh, another uh, story that I learned actually just uh, about a year and a half ago is we offer at Southern Exposure Odell's Large White Watermelon. And uh, we always thought it was developed by the owner of the Palmeria uh, 
plantation in uh, around 1865. But as it turns out, uh, other historical records show that it was not he who developed it, but an enslaved man named Harry who took on the name Sumner's uh, when he was freed. Uh, and this uh, watermelon is particularly well known because it came up during a time of a hotbed of developing new, sweet, uh, thin skin uh, watermelons, including the Bradford watermelon, which uh, nowadays saves, sells for a dollar a seed. Uh, and so uh, I was really excited. Uh, to be able to pull out Harry's name and raise it up and remind people that watermelons are one of the plants that we love that came from to us from Africa. Uh, another th th story that I wanted to share is uh, the story of the Cherokee white eagle dent corn because uh, when we are looking at who owns the seeds, it's always important in the Americas to uh, honor the native people of the Americas and the debt that we owe them in cultivating uh, corn and beans and uh, squashes and other plants of the Americas. And we, ha we at Southern Exposure, oh now 15 years ago, had a an opportunity to repatriate or rematriate, actually, uh, Cherokee white eagle dent corn to the Cherokee uh, nation. They had this variety that had been common and that they had lost the seeds of, and uh, we were able to co operate with the Center for Cherokee Plants uh, and the Reservation Extension Service and uh, donate back uh, seed, which we had gotten through uh, a part Cherokee uh, grower up in, who was whose family lived in Ohio. And uh, there was a successful grow out of a quarter of an acre. And then everyone who was in Cherokee, uh, a part of that reservation who wanted to, had seed stock to start growing this uh, well-known uh, dent corn, which is uh, something that they really uh, appreciated. Uh, another couple of uh, things that I wanted to mention is for us, tomatoes are a big thing, and I sort of, most of the stories that we know are of Appalachian uh, tomatoes like Radiator Charlie's uh, variety uh, that are mostly varieties that had gone to Europe and come back much bigger. But I also want to uh, say that in tomatoes, uh, many of the varieties that do well, that are smaller tomatoes that do well in the South, came from varieties that either went to Africa or uh, the Caribbean and were selected for heat tolerance uh, and became, you know, more stable varieties in the Southeast. There's uh, one that we have now that uh, has at least that coming, uh, being selected from a variety from the Caribbean that's called Alston Everlasting. Uh, it is like one of the first tomatoes uh, to ripen and often one of the last ones and very nice little tomato. Um, and I also wanted to uh, point out black uh, skinned peanuts. They're not well known everywhere, but uh, the areas where they have been maintained are in particular are in the Geechee uh, coastal parts of the Carolinas. And uh, many people say that uh, they were particularly liked there because they reminded black people and uh, people who uh, escaped into the islands 
to uh, be away from slavery uh, of black Bambera. Uh, and they are beautiful and especially tasty. And of course, okra is uh, one of the things that we have uh, an especial indebtedness uh, to Africa for all of these varieties. Uh, and I, we like um, some of the bigger ones, uh, like um, this uh, looks looks like a variety. Uh, I put in uh, Ellen's family heirloom because it reminded me of uh, the records at Monticello that show which varieties um, Jefferson bought from enslaved gardeners and uh, workers there. And uh, cucumbers in the winter was something there, and it's unclear whether actually it was uh, one of the white uh, cucumbers like this or perhaps one of the Armenian cucumbers, which are really um, a, a kind of melon that is eaten whole, skin and all, as a cucumber. but. Uh, they were noted as uh, a variety that was regularly uh, bought by uh, the Jeffersons for use at their table. And it also points out that even uh, during revolutionary time that uh, enslaved people were using their knowledge and working sometimes in the evenings and on Sundays uh, to earn money uh, that sometimes was uh, over time enough to ensure their freedom, but if not, at least to have a better diet for their families uh, and a little bit of uh, money that could be used to exchange for tools and other uh, things that the people wanted. Um, I put this slide up because it was one I made of books uh, about seed saving, and it really pointed out that there are so many are written uh, by white people. I, I guess Dr. David Bradshaw is a, a native person, and uh, Clifton Slade hasn't written a book yet, but he's written, authored many articles uh, on the subject. Uh, I uh, got interested in collards and in collard uh, diversity uh, because of this book by Ed Davis and John T. Morgan, uh, Collards, a Southern Tradition from Seed to Table. It was uh, really eye-opening in that uh, these two cultural geographers had collected varieties from home seed savers throughout the Southeast, and uh, they had over 90 varieties, and it was uh, pretty amazing. You, you can see the diversity, shiny ones like the green glaze, curly ones that almost look like a kale, and blue and purple ones, which were new uh, to me. And uh, collards are, you know, emblematic of uh, what we think of as southern uh, vegetables. And they're particularly American because they were developed from uh, you know, a, a non-heading uh, cabbage, the coleworts uh, that were brought from England, but they where they were not very respected or excited about. But here in the southeast, they were developed in their may, many varieties uh, that now, well, now they're being revived uh, as we work on the heirloom collard project, but. Who would have known? And there's the collard shack, 
uh, in North Carolina where they uh, grow two of the varieties, yellow cabbage collards, and then an off type that is uh, at this point an inextricable uh, part of the mix of the yellow cabbage uh, collards. And this is Levi Grissett, one of the original collard uh, donors to the Davis and Morgan collection. And he was the only uh, one of the black uh, seed savers that they noted who uh, was uh, still alive that I tried to contact. Here are a few more of those purple uh, collards. I have to say that those are my favorite from the Davis Mulligan collection. And to think just how beautiful they are, but I'll think about all those anthocyanins and uh, great nutrients they have. And I wonder if uh, this developing of collards uh, among uh, black people, both uh, before the end of slavery and uh, during the late 1800s and the early 1900s contributed to uh, making a better diet for black people. Uh, a lot of that history about uh, how the varieties were developed is of course lost and unwritten. But there are uh, scholars like Michael Twitty here who uh, are food scholars and use the writings about uh, cooking and food to uh, reimagine what it would be. And it was really lovely when we had Collard Week earlier this year to have Michael come and uh, talk a little bit about uh, collards and how they play into the food scene uh, in the southeast. Uh, another thing uh, about this uh, project that uh, developed after um, Southern Exposure and Seed Savers Exchange and the Utopian Seed Project uh, and uh, started working together uh, on getting the varieties that had been uh, donated to the USDA gene bank uh, from the Davis Morgan collection. Uh, the uh, first group that volunteered to regenerate one of these varieties and uh, offered seed back to the collection of the USDA and also to the uh, International Gene Bank at Svalbard was uh, sorority sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha, Lorraine Mortise, who in her day job is an attorney uh, with the help of Master Gardener Elmer Kesey and her sorority sisters uh, reproduce this one variety which is the William Alexander heading. And they went to extraordinary lengths to uh, produce seed from this variety. Uh, first, there was cold that winter. And then there were various animals coming to get it. So they covered them with these wire cages. And uh, when it was extra cold, put uh, frost cloth over it and they were able to be the first uh, volunteers, uh, seed stewards. And in addition to putting some back in these collections, they made small packets and uh, distributed it throughout the black community in Winston-Salem. Uh, here's another one of uh, our seed growers, Anne Codrading. Dington, who is at Nasani Farm, and what she specializes in uh, is ginger and turmeric. And she is from Belize, and her mom comes up from Belize to help her with uh, her farm that has, you know, a variety of uh, certified naturally grown vegetables, but uh, in particular, 
they specialize in lemongrass, turmeric, and ginger. Here's a, another um, variety. This one is one that my grandmother grew, and they made tea out of it, which they called sorrel, uh, and they still do in Jamaica. But this is Roselle, Hibiscus sabdarifa, and uh, I didn't think about it, uh, but I was traveling uh, 30 years ago in Egypt, and we uh, got invited to a Nubian wedding, and there was this thick, red, sweet uh, drink that was served that they call karkity. And uh, I come to find out that this was uh, their Egyptian version of Roselle, and uh, how that so all came around is about 10 years ago, uh, I started looking at varieties because uh, actually the people at Baker Creek were offering some seed for sale and so I started gathering up all the roselles that we could and this red roselle uh, turned out to be uh, the most productive at our farm in Virginia and since then we've uh, offered another one but when I was uh, in Jamaica uh, on a farmer-to-farmer -farmer learning exchange, uh, I realized that this is like uh, a national drink almost in Jamaica. Everywhere it, it is there, and they make jams, and uh, yeah. So we love this hibiscus sab roof, and it's so beautiful. One year on the National Mall in uh, D.C., uh, it was put up as uh, a fence row, so lovely. Uh, Berea College is one of the uh, groups that we work with, and I thought this, of this as particularly fitting because uh, this is one of the colleges where uh, you, you know, if you're accepted, uh, the college will, you know, provide uh, enough financial aid or work exchange, and everybody who goes there uh, does work exchange as a part of what uh, what they do. So it's really nice to work uh, with the students uh, to produce some of the seed for Southern Exposure. And uh, the other thing in Berea, Kentucky, is Sustainable Mountain uh, Agricultural uh, System uh, Center. And they are especially known for mountain beans. Uh, and you kind of, well, it is kind of uh, a traditional Appalachian thing. But uh, Bill Bess, who's pictured here, uh, pointed out that both there's not a large black population uh, in that area, but people, all of the people, uh, black and white, produce beans and uh, traditionally as well as native people in that area. And here's another one of the beans there. And something uh, that you'll notice about this bean is it's what's called a greasy bean. And those uh, are special because they don't have hairs on the pod, so it makes them look shiny as if they were grease. And uh, they have also the characteristic of staying tender as the beans are forming in the pod so that you can get your protein as well as your vegetable at the same time. And that's what you, leather britches, which were uh, dehydrated beans while they were still green, but the beans had formed all inside of them. Here's uh, another uh, bean in our collection. It's called Selma Zester. And uh, this was uh, a variety uh, that one of our seed growers' great uncle 
provided uh, in the 30s to uh, the Park Seed Company. And she was able to bring that variety back. And here's one that is especially uh, important in traditional black culture. The, this is a, a Crowder uh, bean, or sometimes you know them as black-eyed peas or uh, field peas. And I really like uh, the pink eye purple hull because they just stand up over the top of the leaves and it makes them easy to find and harvest. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, what we grew up with. You got to have for good luck at uh, New Year's. Uh, and this shows a little bit of the variety of growers that we have. Uh, at Southern Exposure, uh, <laughs> I I love what you know. Tomatoes make uh, better seeds if you have to harvest them before they're overripe, so they're being spread out and allowed to after ripen. And that uh, little boy uh, and his siblings uh, grew seeds each uh, crop as a 4-H project. And there's uh, Clifton Slade, and one of the uh, the people that he works with. Uh, think on his uh, project for making a dollar per square foot of each area in a one-acre plot, so that a small farm with half an acre could uh, gross. Um, $26,000 on their half acre. Here's Cliff. His project is called the 43560 project, and it's a very simple uh, way to do organic uh, growing and get extra money. And here he is with some of those William Alexander heading collards, which was one of the traditionally stewarded by a, a black man varieties. And when he grew some, he grew a lot. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of nice about the way that uh, Cliff, who was a former extension agent who's retired back to farming, his wife said, I thought you were retiring, not going back in the farming even more is uh, with the collards that he plants them at a foot and then harvest uh, every other uh, collard uh, plant for the good price market around between Thanksgiving and Christmas and then leaves the remainder to make the seed crop. And there is Cliff when he was a little boy uh, in his family. he They are third generation farmers and now his granddaughter has joined in the family farm and so they have four generations of uh, Slades uh, working in Surrey County. And uh, especially for Cliff is sweet potatoes. He sells a lot of fresh sweet potatoes, but he specializes in providing slips uh, to Southern Exposure and uh, also to other local areas, and uh, in particular heirloom varieties uh, like Virginia Baker that uh, are more traditional uh, in the sandy soils uh, of eastern Virginia. Uh, and this is uh, a project near and dear to my heart. It grew out of uh, the pandemic, really, when uh, a number of gardeners and farmers realized that during the time of the pandemic, there might be uh, disruptions in food distribution. And so uh, they pulled together uh, a, a group that uh, distributed free seeds. And um, out of that uh, came 
an initiative for black and uh, brown-led uh, seed producers. And what was really uh, amazing about this project is that uh, the Ujama, uh farmers reached out to uh, seed companies who had expressed an interest in making there be more equity in the seed producing uh, world. And that group, many, far, many companies uh, in that group offered uh, financial and logistical support for this emerging Ujama Connective. Here's another uh, person who's involved with that, Michael Carter Jr. And uh, in addition to being a part of the Ujama Collective, Michael Carter has uh, three or four sons who run Carter Brothers Seeds, which is a seed company run by these uh, young uh, farmers to be with the help of their father. And they specialize uh, in particular in varieties uh, from Africa and that are uh, especially important to um, people in the African diaspora. And his children were raised at least half of their life in Africa, so they are familiar with these varieties. Here's one of those unusual things from Africa, Soko Yokoto, African Celosia. And Celosia, you know, as I had known it before being introduced to this variety, uh, was, a, you know, a decorative plant. But it turns out uh, that has a very mild flavored, uh, nice cooking green as well. And for people who, uh, like to be prepared, you can have your flower garden and your vegetable too. Um, so hearing some of these stories and, uh, you know, knowing a little bit of the importance from talks uh, that you've had today of having more independence uh, and more of what it took for these uh, seed savers to, uh, you know, maintain so many varieties and to keep uh, the diversity uh, going. Uh, what can you do? Well, one thing is learn to save seeds. In my work with uh, seed savers, I've discovered that many families of seed savers only maintain, you know, one or two varieties that are particularly important to them. But that, uh, how they become real keepers of that is they not only save the seeds, they grow the variety, they eat it, uh, they save recipes, they save the stories that go uh, along with how that seed is um, tied to a particular place and time. Uh, and you can adopt a family heirloom uh, variety that you, you know, use so that uh, it becomes very important, not just to you, but you know, to your children and to other people in your uh, extended community. And then uh, another thing that you can do, even if you're very limited in your seed saving ability, is to grow heirloom and open pollinated varieties. And that act in itself is a pushing back against the consolidation and the tendency to uh, have seed companies offer more hybrid seeds, more GMO seeds, other things that you as a gardener or farmer cannot maintain yourself. And, uh, you know, vote for diversity with your seed dollars. I, you know, I mentioned the Carter Brothers Seed Company, but often at your local farmer's market, those farmers who are maintaining something special will have seeds of those varieties. Uh, if you like them, 
buy some, grow them, save seeds yourself. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, an important way not only to nurture the seeds, not only to carry forth the uh, stories, but to gain more control over our food supply. Uh, I think it, we started out actually in the intro uh, mentioning that Leah Penniman and the folks at Soulfire Farm who really raise up the fact that African people were not just brought to this country to be labor, but brought because of uh, their knowledge. Uh, you know, like if you look at um, the cuisines say, in the Carolinas along the coast, especially in the Charleston area, uh, African were people, enslaved people were brought there to develop that rice culture. And it was there where the peppers from the America, the uh, seafood from the ocean, and the rice that was uh, grown by the enslaved people were the center of what we know now as low country cuisine. And it's really uh, was inspiring to me to look at how many uh, agricultural techniques, how many, you know, how many varieties of food uh, were brought by African people to this country, and how much, uh, even though we own very little of the land in this country, how much influence we've had on the agriculture and the food culture uh, of this country that we live in. And I mentioned uh, Michael Twitty before. Uh, his book, The Cooking Gene, is a really great introduction to uh, looking at what food uh, African people are eating and going backwards to uh, looking at uh, the history of what uh, kind of, you know, agricultural practices uh, were used and what uh, types of food made that uh, cuisine possible. And uh, yeah, another thing is during the civil rights days, it was being able to have grown your own food and put it up was one of the things that allowed black farmers to be able to be hosts to freedom riders and to take an active part uh, in those protests at that time. And now we don't depend so much on agriculture, but if we want health and we want good foods in our communities, then either growing uh, healthy food that doesn't, that's free of chemicals or supporting farmers that are doing is what our communities need in order to have more independence uh, and uh, better health. Wait. Thank you so much, Ira. I was trying to get to that last slide, but it doesn't sure. catch. Oh, okay. And here are a few uh, resources that uh, you can use to look more into the stories that I told. And now you can jump in. <laughs> Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I'm so glad everything's being recorded and saved because I can't wait to dive in um, after the conference to some of the references that you gave to us. We have a couple of questions in the chat or in the Q&A that I can read to you. And I also wanted to start off uh, with my own question. And that is for folks who've never saved seed, what what advice could you give them? You 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 started giving us some advice, but what's the best way to start? Where do you, how do you start? Well, uh, there are a few things that are easy, and I showed you a few beans because 
for many people, beans are the gateway to seed saving uh, because they're big seeds uh, and they're easy to see. And here's the real trick is once uh, your beans uh, have gotten to the size uh, where they're swelling the pod and the pod has turned yellow and is starting to get flaccid, you can bring them inside if you're going to have extremely bad weather uh, and let them finish drying inside or if frost is about to catch them. And so I would say that they are among the easiest things to start. The other things that many people uh, begin with are tomatoes because you can take from a ripe tomato the seeds and smear them on a, a napkin or a paper towel, put it on a plate to dry, and when it's thoroughly dried after, you give it a week so that it has plenty of time to be well dried. You can fold it up and put it in an envelope or in a glass jar labeled and save it for the next year. Uh, on our website, southernexposure.com, and also on the Seed Savers Exchange website, there's lots of details about seed saving for all different you know, varieties. And really, in this time, the younger people I work with love YouTube, so you can get to see people doing everything they're telling you. Thank you. A couple of other questions in the, in the Q&A here. How do we access heirloom seeds as gardeners and beginning farmers? Well, there are a, a number of ways. Uh, one way uh, that is particularly nice is uh, reaching out to people who are offering heirloom seeds uh, at your farmer's market or someplace where you meet them uh, face to face. Uh, the other uh, easy way is to reach out to heirloom seed companies or to very small uh, seed companies, like I say, the Carter Brothers, these young teenagers uh, who are growing seeds and offering them for sales. Uh, another uh, way that's kind of seasonal is usually between February and April, there are a lot of seed swaps that happen all over. And go to one, because not only will you get some seeds, but you'll get some good advice. I love that. Thank you. Uh, one question that came up early on in the beginning of your talk, uh, when you were talking about the fish pepper, here's a question. Uh, when you were talking about Horace Pippin, uh, were you referencing Horace Pippin, the Afro-American artist from early Yes, last that is him. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I, I meant to say that, and I forgot. Yes, he how he ended up uh, giving uh, these exchanging seeds uh, with William Moyes Weaver's grandfather is that he needed some bees for treatment for arthritis. And, uh, and the Weavers uh, had beehives. And so he traded various produce, but including the fish pepper, which then uh, was added to what was called a roughwood con collection and maintained uh, with that history attached to it. That's what I love so much in my own work is the stories behind the seed. And that's, uh, that's so exciting. Um, thank you for sharing that. One other uh, final question was if anyone, uh, you know, maybe is already saving seed, you mentioned several different people who are saving for Southern exposure. If you wanted to save seed, grow, grow out seed and, and participate in saving it on behalf of Southern exposure, what what is that process? Uh, well, usually you write an email or a letter and we send you a grower questionnaire, which will ask you about your experience uh, and, uh, you know, as a gardener or farmer and, uh, you know, direct you toward whether you would be, you know, some people work on regeneration and we would say, 
uh, they want to grow a small amount to maintain something, or you know, other people aspire to growing larger amounts to have it be a significant income for their farm. So you start out with that. We give you some advice about what you, we think might work. If you have no experience, we say it's best to take a small risk, both for the seed company and for the seed grower. Uh, and uh, one of the things, you know, that uh, I think, you know, I think we do a pretty good job, uh, but uh, I'm very excited about this new Ujama uh, seed collective because a, a part of the work of Ujama is more direct uh, education, and so uh, there are a lot of, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting having more black farmers who are reaching out and training each other. Uh, because one of my disappointments with Southern Exposure is we have some black seed growers, but not nearly as many as I would like. And when Ujama came and, uh, you know, got involved actually more directly with that food justice initiative uh, during the pandemic, it, it drew out people who had not thought about seed saving for themselves at all. And we're excited. We're excited to have people interested in uh, Southern Exposure. And we uh, are particularly excited to help uh, stand up this new initiative that maybe will bring more black people into this kind of white seed world. Thank you. We have one final question from Carmen Holmes who said, is it better to store seeds in glass jars or brown paper? I'm keeping them in baby food jars. And then she has another question, how can I join a group? Well, uh, the uh, baby food jars are good. Uh, Kew Gardens did a, a trial uh, on what was good, and they actually said that canning jars are among the best commonly available things to keep seeds in. Uh, but paper bags you can use inside your canning jars. Wrap, you know, put your seeds in either envelopes or brown paper bags and label them well, and then you can put several varieties in the same jar. And how can you join a group? Well, you can always join like the Seed Savers Exchange or Ujama. That's why I put those uh, URLs up there. Hopefully, people will were able to grab ones that they wanted. Uh, and you know, if you send an email uh, to Southern Exposure, uh, I'll also direct you to what groups I know of that are in your area. Although, you know, the Seed Savers Exchange member listings and exchanges happen online, so you don't have to be too close to people. Although being close is extra nice. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm going to turn it now over to Ariella, who's going to tell us about our next our next section. Thank you, Ira. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, and thank you so much, Miss Ira, for your wonderful remarks. Um, it was really a pleasure to hear every everything that you had to say, and um, we hope that you will um, come back next year for for. A, an, another round of um, talks with us. We learned so much from you today. So thank you so much. Thanks. Th so our next and final uh, breakout session, or um, as we finish up the conference, we're going to have some of our committee members um, just come on camera and we're, we have named this session, Where Do We Go From Here? And it's really an opportunity for for folks to give us feedback, but to also talk about um, some of the takeaways that you had from this conference, and um, we'll talk about next steps. And so that's where we are today. Before we get started, 
what I wanted to do is just say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart to all of our speakers that so graciously gave their time and your your knowledge that we you know um, really cannot pay for. Um, we really just thank you so much for taking your time to spend time with us today or if you were a speaker yesterday, thank you so much. We also want to give a special thank you to our sponsors because we would not be able to host such a dynamic event without generous donations from our sponsors and to have exceptional speakers like Ms. Ira Wallace and Leah Pennyman and uh, Malik Yakini. So please, if there's other folks out there who, who would want to donate to our conference next year, um, please let us know. We are always looking for um, ways to expand our network. And with that being said, we are actually in the process of working on building a black farming network. And so we are asking all of our attendees who are not a part of our black farming network yet to please join us. If you would like to be a part of the black farming network, you can email us at blackfarmersconferenceoh at gmail.com. Right now we are building out a quarterly newsletter and we also have quarterly roundtable discussions with our black farming community to discuss relevant topics, as well as it's just an opportunity to get together and just convene with one another. That email address again is black farmers with an S conference OH at gmail.com. And I can also place that in the chat. Community Solutions Agraria is the main host for our Black Farming Conference. And this is actually not the first, this is not the only conference that Community Solutions hosts. So I ask that you please take some time to visit our website or visit us on our Facebook page to enjoy other conferences that Agraria puts on as well. Um, we do have some really amazing folks who um, are researchers and are really just experts in their field, such as uh, Beth Bridgman, who is um, a seed saver herself, who is working on other initiatives with Agraria. And so please follow us on Facebook, come to our, visit us on our website, and there's so much more that we have to offer. And so thank you all. Uh, I see a few of my committee uh, members have joined, so we can go ahead and um, maybe briefly go around and each of us can just give a brief takeaway. Um, one of the things, I guess I'll, I, I'll start until um, folks are ready to start talking, but one of the takeaways that I have, um, first of all, I'll say we, we, we really came together last year and had this uh, idea, and really it was Dr. Kevin Magruder who had the vision of having a black farming conference and just really celebrating the contributions that black farmers have always um, had and contributed to, to this great nation. And we had some great speakers last year, but this year we really had some dynamic and just fascinating speakers that really spoke to our theme for this year. And um, yesterday we heard from Dr. Gordon Nimhard and she talked about the history of cooperatives and Education is so important. I believe earlier Malik talked about how we can go through our entire American um, educational society and may not hear anything about some of the contributions that black and under, other underrepresented folks have really contributed to this country, which is so important. Education and knowing your history is just really critical. And with that being said, I was really just taken aback by how many uh, black cooperatives have been started. Over 160, I believe, is what um, Dr. Gordon Nimhard um, quoted um, it, during the 20th century. And so um, that was something that was really fascinating to me. She also talked about how there were uh, tons of co-ops, black co-ops um, in the 60s that were really developed here in all of the great larger cities in Ohio. So Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus. Um, one of the co-ops that she mentioned was a newspaper that was started in Cleveland, which is my hometown. And so that's one of the takeaways that I had. Um, I'm always just so um, elated by all of the information that I learned from these dynamic speakers that we have. And so 
I'm going to stop talking and pass it over to one of my colleagues who also wants to talk about takeaways. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ariella. Uh, I'll go next. I, I am just saturated with information and excitement about what we have, uh, have done this year. It was so rich and so deep. And there's so many tributaries that we tied together here. And I think my biggest takeaway was putting all those things into a social, a social justice aspect, you know, and, and recognizing the importance of the land and the importance of food and seeing how that all tied together. I was also so impressed with the depth of knowledge that each one of our presenters had and their historical perspective, which was really amazing. And uh, the sad part was what uh, Malik said about Nobody knows this history. We don't get it in school. Most of us don't hear it at home. Many of us have no access to this. So this conference to me is a very, very vital instrument in bringing people together to share the history, to recognize what the resources are, to see how instrumental this piece is with all the other aspects of social justice. You know, and how uh, blessed we are with so many incredible uh, people who are sharing this story. So I just think it was amazing, and I'm so grateful to have been a part of it. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl, so much. Yeah, I um, I want first of all, I wanted to say um, a real shout out to Ariella, who has been really our leader for two years. <laughs> We're so grateful to you and your, your intelligence and your drive and your compassion. And yeah, even, even being a new mother of a beautiful baby, you still managed to pull it off. So, so thank you to Ariella. Um, and then I just also did want to give a shout out. I, I, I was really blown away by this conference. It's really I don't think I would have believed that we could have had a better conference than last year because last year was so exciting. But I, I also did want to mention, which I, I think got said in some sessions, but one of the exciting things for me is that last year after the conference, we there was a Black Farmer Network that was formed and there have been a couple um, networking sessions. And if you are interested, I, I believe... Rachel, that everybody who signed up for the conference will automatically be added to our mailing list, so you'll get word about that. We also have a land access workshop scheduled for October 23rd with a lot of interesting speakers, mostly regional speakers, but if, I think even folks who are not from Ohio would be interested in being part of that. And then, Rachel, I think you put a link to our journal on the um, on the chat, but just to let people know if they are on our mailing list that we actually do have conferences throughout the year. We have one in November on water, and the journals are really a great way to kind of deepen your understanding also of our work. We have um, this upcoming journal will have a focus on the Black Farming Conference, and then we have a journal in the spring that's going to be all about Black farming. So please do keep your eye open for those. And, and Cheryl and Kanisha um, also, and Ariella are also featured in our current um, journal. So please, please have a look. But thanks again for everyone for coming. I, I was really, it was really a very moving experience. Thanks, Ariella. Beth or Rachel? I would just, um, you know, I'm always, um, so heartened that, that the folks doing the work are focusing on the joy um, and the hope. And so, I, and I really, uh, I really, I really felt that. And so Virginia Nazaria um, is another seed saver, a Filipina uh, seed saver and researcher who works out of the University of Georgia. And I heard her also at Seed Savers Conference one time talking about um, marginality and memory and 
and the importance of diversity and diversity is found in the hedgerows. I mean, you know, you don't find it in the monocropping, you find it in the hedgerows. That's, and that's where we are. We are all in the hedgerows. We are the small folks doing this small work and that's where all the diversity is. And, and, and look at this diverse conference and that's where the hope is too. And that's what's gonna save us. And so it was just such a, such a joy for me to be a part of this conference to see and to hear you know, Miss Ira talk about all these young farmers that I didn't know doing this work. It was just so exciting. So I'm really heartened. It was wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Rachel, would you like to say anything? Yeah, one of the things that just really stood out to me, and hopefully I'm not too loud, um, is that, you know, as someone who's like working in this like center for regenerative practice, I think something that I've just really acknowledged, and I think a lot of people I've come around have said, oh, is this some new thing? I think all of us here know that's not true at all. And I'm always happy to share with them that no, there are so many black indigenous peoples for so, for like, for time immemorial, that have been utilizing these practices and caretaking for the land. And so I think for me, I'm just sitting here so grateful to be able to listen and learn. Is there anyone else from the conference committee that wants to make any remarks? Okay, I just wanna say one thing. Uh, I think we would be very remiss not to acknowledge our wizard of technology, who is just amazing, outstanding, and it's so reassuring to have someone with your expertise, Rachel. Thank you so very, very much. So now um, I am actually going to read a comment from one of our um, conference attendees from Marilyn Moore. She says, the conference special guests were all visionary, Malik, Leah, and Ira. And yet all of them also gave us so much specific technological knowledge. The content of this conference was very valuable. Good feelings of kindred spirits who have each, who have met each other. And so I really do think that just that comment really sums up um, what today was really all about. And I want to thank each and every one of you who continue to follow our conference and who were able to join us here today. I am going to end it, end it on that note, but I ask you all to please make sure that you come and see what we're doing uh, in the future. We're going to be hosting this conference again, and we're also going to, again, be expanding our network and lastly, we are asking, imploring you for feedback. So we will be emailing you a survey and we ask that you just take a few moments to fill out that survey so we can best serve you. Um, I, I don't know if I've said this before, but uh, to just be completely transparent, none of the committee members are actually farmers. We are just very passionate about this work and we want to support you. And so it's very important for us to make sure that we are providing resources and giving you the access that you want. And so we really want to hear from you. And so with that being said, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday and we look forward to working with you and seeing you all next year. Thank you.